This is a production of Cornell University. I'd like to extend mountains of gratitude for Barbara and David Zelasnik, whose vision and endowment allows us to bring the published and the promising to our campus. A few shout outs are in order to our former chair, Roger Gilbert, and also our chair, uh, Caroline Levine. Their continued support for our creative writing program is very much appreciated and, and well noticed. I would also like to take a minute to thank with all my heart all of my colleagues in the creative writing program. I cannot begin to, uh, to describe the sheer amounts of hours and hours of reading admissions and mentoring and teaching while maintaining illustrious careers in our American literary landscape. They're awesome. I would also like to give a, a shout out to my a good friend and former colleague, Maureen McCoy, who has countless times saved our, our program by filling the holes in our curriculum when she uh, comes to visit here in Ithaca for the spring. She's truly a remarkable, uh, wonderful teacher and writer, and I just, I really wanted to thank her. And finally, to the friends and family of uh, Richard Cleveland. What a remarkable person he was to have such a devoted community of supporters who join us every year in the celebration of Cleve's life. The Cleveland Memorial Reading event allows us to honor Cleve, but also to provide an opportunity for our own faculty to share their work to our very own community of writers. And now, I get my treat. Robert Morgan, or Bob, as we know him, is an incredible presence at Cornell University's Department of English Creative Writing Program and has been for 40 years. His long, distinguishing career includes his role as a biographer, historian, novelist of such tremendous novels as Gap Creek, which was an Oprah pick, and a New York Times bestseller. Can you connect the two? With his last novel, Chasing the North Star, writer Rendell Keenan explains, quote, Chasing the North Star has the gravity of old slave narratives and the, and the blood-chilling action of a contemporary action thriller, a must-read, unquote. Bob, Bob is also an accomplished poet of 14 collections of poetry. And in 2010, the Southern Quarterly dedicated a whole critical issue on his work. And he's got another one coming out soon, another critical issue with 18 critical essays on his work. His novels and poetry collections continue to inspire scholars to write critically. And his demeanor and brilliance have inspired generations of fiction, fiction writers and poets. He's been awarded a number of prizes, uh, a fellowship of the, uh, from the Southern Writers, the Academy Award in Literature by the, Academy, by the American Academy of the Arts and Letters, the History Award Medal, and is a recipient of numerous fellowships from the Guggenheim and Rockefeller Foundations, the National Endowment, and the New York State Arts Council. A member of the Fellowship of Southern Writers, he was inducted into the North Carolina Literary Hall of Fame in 2010. Born in Henderson, North Carolina on October 3rd, he has taught at Cornell since 1971. We hope to recognize Bob's work this year with a one-day symposium and all-out celebration we have tentatively titled Morgan Fest. So please mark your calendars for, of course, October 3rd, 2019, which coincides with his birthday. And now, without further comment, Bob Morgan. Well, I can't live up to that introduction, of course. <laughs> Uh, I was very young when I came to Cornell, those years ago. 
I thought today I would uh, talk about storytelling, and uh, I grew up among storytellers, uh, and uh, Baptist preachers, and uh, moonshiners, and often uh, they were the same person, actually. Uh, <laughs> I'm sure you've heard uh, the saying that where you have four Baptists together, you will all also have a fifth. <laughs> uh, one of the stories I heard uh, from my parents uh, when I was growing up was about a wedding in Flat Rock, uh, North Carolina, which was a, a vacation spot for the wealthy people in Charleston and Atlanta, came up in the summer where it was cool in the 1830s. And this young girl, very young, who was engaged to marry a French nobleman, disappeared on her wedding night. About uh, 30 years ago, I wrote a poem based on that story. And I'll read that poem and then a short story written later based on the same folklore. It's called Wedding Party. Champagne leapt that warm afternoon on the long porch, and dancers flowed around the orchestra while curious mountain neighbors disapproved and envied from the boundary of wood. The bride and her maids began a game of tag, and when others joined in, they changed to hide and seek. Among the shrubbery and columns, far back into the art barns and sheds they ran, and laughed in the late sun till early evening. One by one, the native audience retired, frowning to their cabins on the ridge. An owl questioned across the lake. Bats hushed and swung above the trees. The young count had come from France and built his many-windowed castle in the pines of the Blue Ridge Mountains. Among the Flat Rock summer folk, he met a child of 17 who slept with dolls and fought with toy weapons. Her family delighted in nobility. The celebrants set a bonfire on the lawn and ran among the shadows of boxwoods and oaks, now free of parents and elders who had withdrawn into the parlor or called for carriages. The young lovers and their friends chased and fled into the cooling night with cries of ma chère, and you're it. They rolled in the new fallen leaves out of the light and vanished into the woods for a second or two. But after several hunts and dashes into the firelight, the bride did not appear, could not be found among the trees and hedges, nor discovered behind a column, nor quiet in a closet of the house. She would not answer their calls and warnings. All took torches from the fire and teased for her among the shadows of the listening slave shacks. The groom, with a shiver, held his fire above the well and looked in only to find water. They broke in companies to circle the lake and discovered a hill man with his son poaching trout. The girls, fainting, hysterical, were hurried home in disarray. At sunrise, the men still explored the nearby woods, faces blackened from smoking brands. Count de Montoil wept into his hands that day on the steps of his mansion as riders returned from local cabins and settlements with no clue. They dragged the lake and the creek pool below the cliff. Passing drovers questioned as far south as the Davis place and north of the French broad knew nothing. Within a month, the handsome diplomat was recalled to France. It was a native workman found his wife still wearing her wedding lace and holding a toy pistol after more than a century locked in a heavy trunk in the attic. So I thought maybe I would write a short story based on the same <laughs> and see if I could put a new twist on that story. 
So, same title, The Wedding Party. It's now 1930s, depth of the Great Depression. And the narrator is a Pentecostal preacher who works as a carpenter. It was one of those old mansions in Flat Rock, maybe the oldest one, built by rich flatlanders in the last century. You know the kind of place with white columns and a third or fourth story and a cupola like the top of a wedding cake. There were porches all around and more windows and gables than you'd want to count. The problem with houses like that is they need so much upkeep. Even rich people don't want to pay for the painting and roofing. I reckon they were built back when wages were near nothing. Bowman Ward, the caretaker, was showing me what needed to be done. The owner, some mill owner from Atlanta, hadn't come up there since the stock market crash. Several windows need caulking before you paint, Bowman said, and the roof leaks in a dozen places. I'll need scaffolding to reach those dormers, I said. Can't you use a ladder? Can't reach them, I said. No need to tell Bowman I didn't have any insurance because my bad back. I'd been hurt on a job down in Greenville and couldn't get insurance anymore. After the fall, they gave me a one-time settlement, which was soon spent, and they wouldn't hire me again. That's why I was uh, taking whatever I could find at wages below scale. I was a minister of the gospel on Sundays at the full gospel holiness church, but I couldn't get any insurance because of the back injury. Can't you rent scaffolding, Bowman said. Might be able to rig a platform out of two befores for the dormers, I said. I walked around the front of the house where the boxwoods lined the walks and the porch was wider than most houses. Just looking at the porch made you think of ladies in low-cut dresses, uh, dancing to the orchestra and men in high collars sipping from frosty glasses. My grandpa had told me how the rich people in Flat Rock lived in those days with garden parties and banquets and tents. He'd worked as a carpenter at this very place, and he said the young women back then wore dresses so low you could see their bosoms. He said they chill champagne with ice from the cellars and danced till it was morning. Why are the front windows still covered with shutters? I said to Bowman. Because the owners didn't come this year. Since the Depression hit, they haven't been back to Seven Oaks. I'd forgotten that the place was called Seven Oaks. In the vast front lawn, there were several big oak trees and evergreens lined the driveway. It was a circular driveway made for carriages. This is the house where the girl is supposed to have disappeared, Bowman said. Disappeared on her wedding night, never seen again. I don't believe such a tale, I said. It's supposed to be true, Bowman said. They say the house is haunted. People like to tell stories, I said. A tale gets started and just keeps growing. Wind swept uphill from the lake, tossing leaves from the walkway and flower beds. Water sparkled in the distant lake like brushed steel. It was some kind of French count that built this place, Bowman said. I think his name was uh, de Chaucel or something like that. He walked along the driveway. We climbed the front steps out of the sunlight. Our feet drummed on the wide porch and my teeth chattered a little as Bowman unlocked the front door. Bowman's wife had just up and uh, run away about five years before. She and Bowman had always quarreled, and it was thought she had a lover. It was rumored Bowman was glad to get rid of her. But nobody ever mentioned the scandal around Bowman. How could a girl disappear with a hundred wedding guests around her, I said. I'd heard the story several times since I was a boy. Let me show you uh, which windows need caulking first, Bowman said, and then we'll look at the roof later. The great parlor inside had carpets and a gleaming hardwood floor, but the furniture was covered with sheets. It gave me a chill just to look at all those ghostly white cloths draped over sofas and chairs, bureaus and high boys. I saw something move and jumped, and then realized it was us in a tall mirror. Where do you go to church now, I said. I wanted to think of something more cheerful. Bowman's family had always been Baptist, but I'd heard they had a fuss at the Poplar Grove Church and split off. We still go where we always went, Bowman said. You'd be mighty welcome at the full gospel holiness, I said. 
Bowman led me to a high window at the end of the long parlor. There was a water stain on the wallpaper beside the window frame. This one needs caulking the worst, he said. Through the glass, I could see the tall hemlocks swaying and twisting outside. There was a whisper where air came through a crack around the window. It felt colder inside among the mirrors and chandeliers than it had outside. What was the girl doing when she disappeared, I said. She was in her wedding dress, Bowman said. She was only 16 the day she married the Frenchman. They had the ceremony at St. John in the Wilderness Church. And then there was a feast and dancing on the front porch. I reckon the celebration went on all day, and then along about dark, the girl and some of her friends started the game of hide-and-seek. In her wedding dress? She was only 16, Boma said. I've heard she still played with dolls and toys. We climbed the big winding staircase up to the second story. The stairs were as wide as a highway. At the top was a hallway running the length of the house. There's a window in the master bedroom in bad shape, Bowman said. It was so dark... I'd have to bring a flashlight or lantern to see what I was doing on the inside. The second floor smelled like dust and old face powder or talcum powder. How long has it been since they lived here, I said. Like I said, they came up the summer before the stock market crash. Don't seem like a friendly house, I said. Any two of the bedrooms are bigger than the house I grew up in or the house I still lived in with Mabel and her four young ones. People say it's still haunted. That's why the owners don't want to stay here. People like to talk that way, I said. The bedroom doors were all closed. In the master bedroom, the furniture was covered. I saw a water stain on the wall. It looked like tobacco juice. This window will need a lot of work, Bowman said. There was a brass telescope pointed through the window and a globe the size of a wash pot in the corner, and there was a dead squirrel on the floor below the window, dead so long it was dried flat and its eyes looked like daubs of glue. Died of heat in the summertime, Bowman said, and pushed the fur with his foot. Where were they playing hide-and-seek? I said. Do you want to tell stories or start work, Bowman said. You're the one that started telling, I said. Bowman patted the water stain like he thought I might not have noticed it. Uh, they was hiding all over, he said. They hid behind boxwoods and in the hedge. They hid in closets in the house and under the porch. I heard they giggled and shrieked as they run out of the dark. I reckon boys and girls wrestled and put their hands on each other, as they'll do, in fun. It was a wedding party, but the bride and her friends flirted like 16-year-olds will while the groom smoked his pipe and the older guest watched the young folks romp and holler from the porch and parlor. The Frenchman was much older. He was at least 20 years older than the girl, Bowman said. I looked out the window toward the lake. The glass was so old it seemed to ripple and stretch. There were crows in the oak trees. So when did she disappear, I said. It was long after dark, and many of the guests had called for their carriages and gone home. The groom suggested to his bride it was time to stop the game, but she only laughed at him and ran away. The boy who was it counted to a hundred and hollered and hollered that he was coming to look, and there were screams and laughing as the young folks run into the shadows, and everybody found was found one by one, but they couldn't find the bride. First everybody laughed, and then they started calling her name. Everybody went looking, even the Frenchman went looking, and she was hiding. Nobody knows, Bowman said. They looked among the boxwoods and all the shrubbery. They lighted torches and looked in the woods and around the lake. They even looked in the well and among the barns and stables. And they searched the house. Of course they looked in the house. They searched the cellar and all the rooms and closets. They looked in the attic and on all the porches. They even took a lantern and looked in the cupola. And they searched the road. They sent parties along the road as far north as the French Broad. And south of the state line, they questioned drivers and travelers, and nobody had seen her. It's just a story, I said. You better get to work, Bowman said, if you plan to get anything done today. Bowman wanted to act like a boss man because he was caretaker for the rich people in Atlanta. I know how to earn my pay, I said. I learned a long time ago won't do to let somebody boss you around or low-rate your work. Once they start running over you, they'll never stop. Reckon there's a lot of carpenters out of work, Bowman said. I do a day's work for a day's pay, I said. Don't your church pay you nothing? 
they give me what they can. These are hard times, and times will get worse before they're better, Bowman said. Before Bowman left to go to town for roof paint and a roll of tar paper, he told me to take a flashlight and climb up the attic. You'll see where the old roof is leaking, he said, and then he was gone. I got the ladders and started to caulk the windows. I'd get that done before I looked at the attic. Caulking windows is almost as dull as paint. I cut the end off the nipple of the tube of caulking and squirted the white paste into the cracks around the windows on the first two stories. I filled every split in the old wood and knocked away loose putty around the panes. I spread fresh putty and smoothed it with a knife. As I scraped and brushed, caulked and smoothed, I kept thinking about the girl in her wedding dress playing hide and seek among the boxwoods and shadows of lantern light. Bowman said she was just a girl that played with dolls and toys. I kept thinking of a child playing children's games on her wedding day and night. Had she dreaded the wedding night and was putting it off for the children's games? Had she fallen in the lake and drowned? Had she been kidnapped by highway robbers? Had she run away with a younger boyfriend to the west? The old turnpike was now U.S. 25. I heard a police siren go by on the road and there were pine trees at the end of the lawn. I could see red lights flashing beyond them. When they held torches over the well and looked in that night, could they see all the way to the bottom? It's just a story, I reminded myself. Think about how you're going to pay your bills. Think about what you're going to preach on Sunday. Think about poor Bowman whose wife left him. I finished the windows Bowman had showed me by lunchtime. The breeze under the trees was so cold, I shivered once I got out of the sun. It was cold in the big house, but at least it was out of the wind. I ate my dinner in the Model T truck because it was warmer there. As I ate biscuits and sipped coffee from the thermos, I looked at the dormer windows on the top of the house. They stood out like raised eyes on a frog. They uh, would indeed be hard to reach. I'd have to build some kind of platform beneath them. But I could put off the dormers until the next day. Why not do what Bowman had said and check the water damage in the attic this afternoon, find out uh, where the leaks were, and worry about the scaffolding later? The sun had gone in. It was getting colder, even in the Model T. I reached into the glove compartment for my flashlight. The batteries were weak, but maybe they'd give me enough light to see the underside of the roof. I hadn't been able to afford new batteries. When I entered the house, it felt cold as an icebox. Freezing air seemed to tumble down the stairs. As I climbed, I didn't look at the furniture all covered with sheets, and I didn't look at the mirrors as I passed them. It was darker in the house than it had been that morning. I shivered as I climbed to the third story. Something rustled behind the door, but I figured it must be a mouse or maybe a bird that had come down the chimney. There were fireplaces in most of the rooms. Bowman said the stairs to the attic were in the closet at the end of the hall. I opened a door and somebody in white stood there facing me. But it was just a dummy or a mannequin like dressmakers use to fit clothes on. My breath was short. You're acting silly, preacher boy, I said to myself. You let that silly story get to you. When I found the stairs and started climbing, I felt my way in the dark. I didn't want to use up the juice in the flashlight until I had to. The air in the stairwell smelled like old tobacco and something else. Rat pee, sour rags. When I reached the attic door and opened it, I was relieved to see there was little light from the dormer windows. They were small and only threw light close to them, but it was better than no natural light. I paused to get my eyes adjusted and looked away from the windows. There were boxes all around the attic and old chairs and benches. I looked into the dim corners and I looked at the chimneys. Strings were stretched between the rafters and old leaves were tied to the strings. I walked between boxes to look closer. That's where the tobacco smell was coming from. Somebody left tobacco up there to cure years ago and forgotten it. Something fluttered against my cheek and lips. Was it a moth, cobweb? I wiped my hand across my face and slapped it away. You idiot, I said to myself. It's just an old attic. You're alone in the house. Nobody's going to hurt you. You're a minister of the gospel. Don't be silly. All I had to do was a flashlight to look at the roof. Nobody's going to see me or do anything to me. The floorboards creaked as I walked on them. Something else fluttered in the darkness, probably a bat. Most old attics had bats in them. Keep yourself steady, Reverend, I said. I switched on the flashlight and pointed at the roof above, but the 
rafters and braces up there. We're in the dark, and the boards were so blackened with age, the dark swallowed up the beam. The flashlight was so weak, it threw a pitiful spot into the blackness. I strained my eyes to see water stains on the undersides of the roof. It was hard to see much of anything without a stronger light. I'd have to get Bowman to bring a new flashlight or furnish new batteries if I was to make any kind of inspection of the roof. It came to me that any leaks uh, would drip on the floor below. You could tell where the worst leaks were from the stains on the floor. I turned the flashlight on the floor, and sure enough, among the old books and papers, the jars and cigar boxes, I saw circles and craters in the dust where the drips had splashed. There were circles big as elephant tracks where puddles had spread and dried up. There were little circles and runlets where one puddle had touched into another. There were so many splash tracks, it was hard to tell where the leaks were exactly. And I recalled how water from a leak will run down a rafter before it drips off. So the drips might not be exactly under the leaks. I'd still have to get a stronger flashlight to examine the roof. That's when I saw the shoe print in the dust. Holding the weak yellow beam closer, I could tell it was a man's shoe. Somebody had walked through the dust recently. My heart jumped into my throat. I swept the flashlight ahead but couldn't see anything. Something brushed my cheek like a wing. I slapped it away and I heard a flutter in the air toward the chimney. Calm yourself, preacher, I said. Bending closer, I saw the shoe prints were so fresh you could spot nail holes in the heels. I followed them around a chair and between boxes of the chimney and under the tobacco, then I busted out laughing. They were my own tracks. <laughs> they circled past the strings of tobacco and right back to where I had first noticed them. You fool, I chuckled to myself. I laughed again to make myself feel better. On Sunday, I'd be standing in my pulpit describing the dusty, spidery attic in the house of the rich. I shined the light on the floor again and saw that my tracks had disturbed older tracks in the dust. They were dim tracks, like tracks in snow that had been covered by later snow, tracks so vague you could hardly see their outlines. I followed the old tracks toward the far end of the attic. They must have been made by Bowman or others bringing boxes up there or looking for things or by other carpenters coming up to inspect the roof and braces. There were tracks that might have been made years ago still showing through the dull coatings of dust. I shined the light around the box and saw an old trunk. There were no tracks in the dust around it. It was an old steamer trunk covered with leather and the leather was mostly eaten away by rats. And then I saw there were tracks going up to the trunk, but they were so dim you could hardly see them. The trunk was not locked, but a pipe stem had been stuck in the latch holding it tight. With childish curiosity, I pulled out the pipe stem and saw it was an old, it was an, an old clay pipe that had cracked. I lifted the lid to see what had been left in the trunk. The flashlight was so dim that at first I couldn't see a thing. Holding the light closer, I found lace, the lace of a wedding dress. And then I saw the yellow hair and a skull with the mouth opened in a scream. And I saw the finger bones holding a doll clutched to the smoldering bosom of the fancy low-cut wedding dress. At first I thought it must be a trick. Bowman was playing on me. After telling me that story about the bride, but when I looked closer, I saw the bones were real. And the hair was real, and the bones didn't look a hundred years old either, for I could see dried black stuff on the bones that must have been flesh. My hand shook so bad I could hardly close the lid. And I wondered what I would tell my congregation later about the moment I had opened that trunk and found Bowman's wife. Thank you. This has been a production of Cornell University, on the web at cornell.edu.